Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by the members of OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with ManicExpression.com, the website where you can truly express yourself. Welcome aboard to this very special episode of Casual Chats. As usual, I am Patricia. And I'm Kevin. And today we have ourselves a very special guest over. Now I know we've had a lot of special guests over in the past, uh, such as voice actors, but in this case we have ourselves a creator. Now this creator happens to be someone very special, very endearing for both Kevin and myself. He has uh, delved in with a lot of shows from Pee Wee's Playhouse to Dinosaur Train. But a lot of people who grew up in the 90s know him for only one show, and that is the 1996 Nicktoon Hey Arnold. So joining with us today is none other than animator and creator Craig Bartlett. Craig, welcome aboard to Casual Chats. Thank you. Hello. Welcome aboard, Craig. Nice to talk to both of you. So, um, Kevin, would you like to start with some questions? Uh, go ahead, Teddy. You go first. Okay. Well, Craig, um, I have a question to ask you. The first thing that we want to know about, you, we already get, got a gift of what made you decide to become an animator because of all the experiences that you had in your love for drawing. But I just want to know that um, what kind of inspirations did using your animation to be able to create life? Like what was my, my biggest inspiration for being an animator? Yes. And my basic sense of humor from those guys, and uh, the the when I think about the stuff that I do now, I'm, I'm always kind of pulled back into kind of musical stuff. Kind of, uh, I'm always thinking of like shows and like like stage and, and Broadway kind of influences that that when I'm making cartoons now that make me think I probably got that stuff from the Warner cartoons because their humor seemed to be based on old like vaudeville routines and stuff from and radio shows. And that was what was kind of funny about it too is that like I wouldn't know what the original references were. I just knew they were funny. Like I didn't know what, what old radio uh, character uh, coined the, the phrase that the Warner Brothers animated characters would be saying. But then it was a lot of that, a lot of references to pop culture. And of course now, I mean, <laughs> those, those, those were 60 years ago or, or more and, and who knows what those shows were. But, you know, I think that's where I got my sense of humor. And then, I would also say uh, the Charlie Brown specials that played in the 1960s, those those were new when I was a kid. Like the Charlie Brown Christmas special was the first one and I, I was the perfect age for it. I was probably kind of like Arnold age, you know, like I'm sure I was in the middle of grade school, which is also where Charlie Brown is. You know, the, the Charlie Brown vibe was really kind of blue and jazzy and melancholy and kind of grown up and and the uh, uh, Warner cartoons were just, you know, hilarious and crazy. But those were the, I guess, you know, those were the biggest influences on me. Yeah, I kind of noticed that because a lot of people, whenever they're talking about the c- comparison to Disney cartoons and Warner Brothers cartoons, they always <clears throat> say that Disney is classic and Warner Brothers is jazz. And <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. And you, and you know, um, it's actually kind of interesting. I'm going to um, just uh, be off topic for just a second. I had a really strong feeling that, you know, cartoons that you created, like such as Hey Arnold, it was kind of inspired by the Peanuts cartoons. In fact, yeah. there's a good friend of mine from Manic Expression named that long-haired creepy guy. He actually did a video <laughs> that compared Hey Arnold to the Peanuts cartoons, and he didn't know for sure if... The, you know, it was confirmed that you got your inspirations from that or not. And from hearing this, I guess we can finally safe to say that the <laughs> Arnold was heavily inspired by Peanuts cartoons. Yeah, and you know, when you go to sell a cartoon show, you have to you have to sell it to the the network. And so when I got to Nickelodeon, 
and they, you know, of course they, they're going to ask those kind of questions. They're going to say, well, what's the show about? You know, who, who are these characters? You know, why, why should we make it? And uh, I told the people at Nick then, it was um, uh, Jerry Laybourne was president and Herb Scannell was, was the vice president. And I remember meeting with them and telling them it would be, I would try to make a kind of a Charlie Brown for the 90s. Which, you know, like the, the Charlie Brown of my childhood was from the 60s and 70s. And, and so it was like a generation later. And I knew, I, I kind of knew that there really wasn't very much like that at, at the time. But, you know, it was the same back in the back in those days. There, there really weren't very many cartoons that were like Charlie Brown. I just thought it would yeah. be cool to do another show about a bunch of kids that are kind of real. And uh, it's very, you know, the, the Charlie Brown kids are... It's pretty intelligent. They're pretty smart, and they and they kind of speak. They don't speak like little kids. They kind of speak like adults. And so, those were all things that I liked. And it turned out that uh, Herb Scannell, in particular, was a huge Charlie Brown fan. In fact, he used to talk to me in the '90s when when I'd go to New York and meet with him. He, he would say, "Wouldn't it be cool if we could figure out how to, uh, you know, also make a, a new pants, you know, a, a, an updated." Uh, Charlie Brown show, and I know he he wanted to. I don't think anything ever came of that, though. You know, I know that they and they're, the Schultz family is still making peanut specials right now. I think with Warner Brothers, so it's not like it isn't going on. But Nickelodeon was interested in that idea a long time ago, and why don't we just talk about it? Yeah, I can definitely see that because at the time when Hey Arnold was coming out. A lot of cartoons were definitely trying to go into the whole Ren and Stimpy craze by trying to copy off of Ren and Stimpy and the gross-out humor and the off-color animation. And yeah, then, there was a lot of other, other styles besides what we were doing, for sure. Yeah, definitely. So when Hey Arnold debuted in October 7th, uh, alongside with another Nicktoon, Kablam!, Hey Arnold was definitely a standout because the last time that we did have a show for Nickelodeon that was realistic and down to earth was Doug, which which came out like five years beforehand. So seeing right. this generated a new generation of fans. Yeah, it sounds right. Now, um, I have a question regarding about Nickelodeon. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you probably either find this as a big coincidence or you find this as like a, a string of fate. But when I reviewed Rugrats for the Nickelodeon tribute, I pointed out that a lot of the people who worked on Pee Wee's Playhouse eventually worked on Rugrats, such as you and E.G. Daly and Mark Mothersbaugh and Cindy Lauper and eventually Paul Rubens himself when he did the Christmas special. So I got to know, is that a coincidence or is that a string of fate? Um, it's really that a lot of those key people were right next to each other. Like, like, uh, Mark Mothersbaugh, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, Klasky Chupo is the company that made Rugrats and Gabor Chupo was a big Mothersbaugh fan. And, and, and Gabor was the kind of guy, or he still is, but he's the kind of guy that just, uh, he, he's really gregarious and he's out kind of in the scene and he, he just, he's a really busy guy who's doing a lot of different things. And he was, you know, I think he even started a, a music label sometime in the 90s when we were doing Rugrats. He's just that kind of guy. He's like, let's make records, let's do all this stuff. And so he just met up with Mark Mothersbaugh right away and brought him over. And so just by being, you know, in the same town and, and you know, just sort of the, the cross-pollinization between those two shows is really just that these people were around and it was really easy to run into them. And so I, well, that was actually one of the things that, that actually drew me to Rugrats in the first place was that Mark Mothersbaugh scored that pilot and I was like, oh, that's because I'm a huge fan. I, I, I loved Devo when they were a new band. And um, so, yeah, I was a big fan of, of him. So the fact that he was going to be scoring Rugrats made it incredibly appealing to me. I mean, I wanted to do the job anyway, but uh, I was really happy that it, it seemed incredibly cool that I was going to be working with Mothersbaugh again. Nice. Kevin, do you have any questions? Yeah, who was your favorite guest star that appeared on Hey Arnold? A uh, guest star? Well, yeah, let's see. Like, I know there was Jennifer <laughs> Tilly. Um, who else was there? Uh, uh, the, the, the actor who played Mickey Kaline. Patty, who was that? Oh, Ron yeah, Cole? Mickey Kaline. Heck yeah. Those are both, you know, okay, uh, Randy Travis being Mr. Uh, Mr. Wynn's singing voice, and uh, uh, yeah, Ron Perlman being Mickey Kaline are probably at the top. Also, uh, Vincent Schiavelli, who was Pigeon Man, 
and he was also Mr. Bailey in uh, in the Christmas special. And I think we had Bailey. Again. Oh yeah, Bailey was in the movie. So that really? was awesome, actually, to go back and um, and reconnect with Vince Schiavelli to play in the movie years after he had done oh. Bailey. And he couldn't remember when when he came in. He's such a great guy. He couldn't remember uh, what uh, Bailey sounded like, you know, because he's an actor and done a million voices between those two uh, sessions. Right. And uh, and so we, we had to go find it. And I remember for some reason, usually we're prepared, but for some reason we didn't have the uh, the old uh, vocal performance uh, available and we had to search and search and somebody had to go look for a tape and <laughs> then they had to find it and bring it back to the studio and, and, uh, and cue it up. And he was really surprised when he heard it. And it was funny too because it seemed like a really normal, you know, remember Mr. Bailey? He's just sort of like a, you know, a New York, uh, uh, his accent was just sort of like from, from New York and just sort of a regular guy. And uh, I was surprised that when we when we were talking about it, he couldn't kind of instantly find it. But uh, it, Vincent was amazing. And he was a really interesting character anyway. Do you know what he looks like? He's a super tall, weird looking guy. He, by the way, really? he, he died oh, in, wow. in the last five years, I forget when, but he's, he's one of the many actors on the show who, who have since died. But uh, he, he was you know, an older guy and a total gent, really tall and weird looking. He was one of the uh, inmates in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. We oh, remember how all wow. those inmates were so strange looking. So, uh, you yeah, know, Vince, Vince was a, a character actor for sure. But he was awesome. And Ron Perlman, uh, both of his, I think he did two or three Mickey K line shows. He was fantastic. I remember when he did, you yeah. know, the big speech at the end of the baseball when, uh, when uh, he tells Arnold that ever since he was a kid, he always wanted to play baseball. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah, he when he did that, it was almost whispered. It was very his whole delivery was very soft because we thought that would be cool. We thought it'd be cool if uh, uh, you know Mickey Kaline when when Arnold meets him, he's just a, like a big huge guy and really gentle with a really quiet voice. And uh, and so when he when he uh, did that long speech, and it's basically you know kid, ever since I was you know that, that speech and. Uh, uh, I remember I had a cough. I had a cough that wouldn't go away. I'd had it for weeks, and it was really oh, uh, I'm sorry about, about that. every every minute or so. I'd have to like, <laughs> and, and uh, we were recording, and I always record in the room with the actors. I'm always in there, and so there's always you know my, mics up, and, and so if you make noise, you can ruin a take. And uh, I like to read in with them, you know, so I'm always in there. And uh, uh-huh. so when when he was in the middle of the speech that we used. I, I cough started to come on, and I got down on all on my hands and knees, and just kind of buried my head between my knees and tried not to cough. And it was just like tears were coming out of my eyes. But it was a, re- it was a really good take, and, I'm, and it's just that way. Like, there's always, you, you know, when when we're recording. By the way, that's my favorite part of of uh, the whole process is you go in with the finished script and you record the the script with the actors. That's always my favorite part. Like, I know after that, a whole lot of really cool stuff happens. Like, they, you know, storyboards are drawn, a lot of art is, is done after, and and then it's animated. And, you know, it's a huge deal. There's a lot of music scores put over it. There's a lot of important stuff that comes after the recording of the voices, but it's still my favorite part. And you can sometimes just tell it, like, magic is happening, and, like, this is the take. This is so awesome. And that was just one of those times where... I'll always remember that while he was saying that amazing speech. I was like doubled over and crying and trying not to. And then there's, you know, and then there's doubled over crying because you're laughing, right? You know, where it's the it's the funniest thing you've ever heard. It's just killing you and you're going to wreck the take if you laugh on the track. And that's happened too. I've, I have ruined takes by laughing oh. many, many times. Oh, man. What happened when you laugh? Like when you did a take, like what happened? Like say if you like giggled or you laugh like did they have to do it all over again like what was you can, they'll, they'll, the guy the engineer will just come on and say you blew that one uh, you laugh on that you gotta do it again so and there's a lot I mean that's kind of part of the fun too is there's a the, the doing again is is you know we're always doing it again <laughs> and, and it's, it's really it's a fascinating process especially recording kids which I'm doing again now with Dinosaur Train is there's the, all the kids on the show are being played by actual kids and that right. always makes it more interesting. You, there's a lot of factors that are harder to control. Kids are, are not as disciplined about, you know, like when to, when to make noise and 
when to not make noise and and so there's a kind of more chaos and spontaneity and stuff and also there's the way that we record voices anyway i like to um a lot of people just have one person at a time come into the booth and just read the read their lines and go i like to do the whole script with everybody there and if, if you're in the scene you, you you get up and stand at the mic and if you're not you sit down but everybody wears their headphones and they listen to the whole show because i think it's it's way better i think they understand why they're saying what they're saying better and everybody uh everybody plays off each other's energy and there's a lot of that going there's a lot of cool fun spontaneous things that happen because everybody's in the room together but uh you know i like to have the mics up and live and some sometimes stuff gets ruined because somebody else you know somebody was on the track at the same time but i like to make it as real as possible because that's how you get those those good performances and that's another influence of charlie brown you know that was those were uh, children that played the voices on the Charlie Brown series. And so uh, I just wanted to do the same thing. I was like, oh, let's get real kids. And then, of course, yes. when we cast yes. it, um, Franny, uh, Francesca Smith, uh, came in to read for Helga. And as soon as I heard her, I was like, oh, crap, that's it. Let's just hire her, and then it's got to be kids. And right. that'll, that'll be that. <laughs> yeah. it'll, be, it, it, it'll be Franny Smith and a bunch of other people. <laughs> Now, I mean, I, I, I think, and I, I got to say this, I think that's the genius of, like, I mean, I, I love Peanuts, don't get me wrong, but I thought that was the real genius of Hey Arnold, because, like, like no disrespect, I like Doug, but, like, you had, like, adult actors, but for Hey Arnold, you had, you know, you had actual kids voicing kids, which made it more authentic, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think kids also at the time, like, I, I know when I was growing up watching it, we could easily relate, because we would know the difference between, like, say... An actor doing like, uh, like doing like a, a teenager, but having a real kid. I mean, did they say that they wanted like to have adults at first? Um, no, but it was just sort of the assumption because you know, oh, Rugrats. Oh yeah, adult. I'm glad they and, did. And uh, and so that was kind of the way that it's done, and and uh, it was a little unusual. To, I, I don't know. At the time we did the, when we started Hey Arnold, we might have been the only show that had kid actors, but but uh, it's possible that we were the only one. I, I really don't know, but I just thought, wouldn't it be cool? And and uh, I agree with you completely. I think um, our audience just sort of instinctively knows that it's it's really kids, and I think that makes them more relatable. And I also think that the naturalness of a kid's performance somehow you, you it becomes more emotionally authentic. And I've always said that about Hey Arnold was that um, oh, yeah. when we got into it and started making them we realized that it had a kind of emotional authenticity because of the fact that we had real kids. And I, I think really honestly, because the Helga character um, just became so so powerful because of kind of what we were trying to do with it and what, what Franny brought as an actor. And then they, then you had that really powerful kind of realism and then it, made, it influenced everything else. It made me want to make uh, the show more of an emotionally realistic show where it's sort of about being sad, you know. It's, sort of, it's about it's about kind of longing and things not coming true, and and uh, you know, kind of a, a dreamy sort of philosophical show. <laughs> and and was, I, I think it was really influenced by the by the fact that we used real kids. Oh yeah, and it was a very powerful show altogether. I mean, there was so many brilliantly written episodes, and like the pitch, like we were talking about before, the the Christmas special, the Pigeon Man episode. I mean, they were yeah. very. I mean, I gotta say, like, I mean, I like the show a lot. That I cried with, with um, with the Christmas special. Um, you know, I was just a very hard, when they were trying to look for his daughter. I was, just, I mean, I, I still, I, I still try to get choked up because it was so good, and that, and that's very rare that that happens when you watch like a, a special on TV. That's like, wow, you know. I really, but it was a good crank because I, you know, I'm glad that they were able to reunite in Arnold, and that's what I loved about Arnold that he was so helpful. You know, yeah, he, he, he yeah. Helped. No, it's true. The the thing that you, you try to sort of figure out what he's gonna do, and, and honestly, yeah. Ar- I I kind of just thought Arnold. He just is. He's just gonna be there, and you know, he'll he'll live a really interesting life that that kids will want to watch. Just by his life, he doesn't have parents. He lives in a boarding house, and the the borders are all kind of eccentric, and his grandparents are kind of crazy, and so his yeah. life is just interesting anyway. And then he would be kind of mellow. He wouldn't he wouldn't be He's not a really cartoony character. He's more of a kind of a thoughtful kid. And then what happened was, as we made the shows, you realize, yeah, he's just a good guy. He kind of helps people. And that that was it. And we realized, you know, that's not, it's not a really easy sell. It's kind of a, it's a kind of, 
kind of a low concept character that if you really you think about it, you know, there's always a point when you, you're trying to sell a show and the, the network asks you, well, what, what's going on? What's, what's the deal with this guy? And it's kind of, it's hard to explain. I said, oh, he'll just be in the middle of it. And all these really crazy characters around him. You know, you can picture the more, the more kind of wild characters like Harold and Helga and, you know, Stinky and stuff, you know, that are, that are kind of more obviously funny. And that yeah. then Arnold would be just kind of chilling in the middle and kind of helping everyone. And then, <laughs> and then <laughs> as it went along, and then years went by, and we made dozens of episodes, and we got further and further in, I, I thought he became even more kind of almost like magical, more kind of Buddha-like, you know, where <laughs> he's almost supernatural. And, and, you know, and then, of course, all the, all the stuff like in the journal kind of sets up that he really is a sort of a supernatural character. Which is just funny. That's just me at the at the end of a hundred half hours going, you know, fuck it. He's supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, totally, totally agree. Yeah, I'm I, glad I, you like the. I'm glad you like the Christmas show because I, I agree. That's that's a really special story. It's a really, uh, it's an intense story, very heavy and beautiful. I love um, when Mr. Wynn tells Arnold. You know, you know that whole kind of flashback scene in the beginning of the show when he explains what happened to Mai? That sequence is so amazing, man. It's like, I know there's not a lot of cartoons like that, you know? It was hard to think. Jim Lang, who, you know, I can't say enough about Jim Lang and his scores. Um, Jim's score of that bit is a little, it's like a three-minute cue, which is the whole Mr. Wynn flashback story. That is such an awesome cue. I love to play that once in a while. It's got a little Jimi Hendrix. It's got it's got the whole my theme, which is a like a, a wooden flute. Yeah. It goes it goes da 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 da. da. That's the that's the my theme, and it, which runs all the way through that special. When he first, um, it's great. When you first go to Arnold's house, it's nighttime and it's snowing, and Mr. Wynn uh, comes to the door. And he, he's stepping up to the door and opening it, and he thinks he hears, ah, and it's, which means, um, dad, in Vietnamese. And he turns, and there's, you just hear that flute. It's really cool. I mean, it's one of, the specials were great because you got a whole half hour, and, uh, and so you had a chance to develop your story a little bit longer, and that gave Jim the opportunity to make musical themes that would, you know, repeat through the show. And so the specials were always really fun for that reason. They they generally, there was a lot happening musically. Yeah, definitely. And I think, in my opinion, another one that is just as captivating and touching, but at the same time, it has its comedic moments. And I feel it's one of the most overlooked episodes in the entire series is the Veterans Day episode. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you like that. Yeah, that one's a little, even more kind of eccentric. And, and uh, um, yeah, yeah, kind of kind of forgotten now. Like people don't talk about the Veterans Day show. Yeah, I it's partly. I, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that as of to this day, I do not know of any animated show that has an episode dedicated to Veterans Day. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you'd say that because we were way in. I think that might be fourth season. Probably, probably fourth season. Maybe even fifth, but I think it's fourth. And we uh, we were seriously we're like, okay, we've done Christmas. Halloween, Valentine's Day, uh, like summer. Um, uh, you know, we, we really were seriously running out of uh, holidays. <laughs> so so, uh, so we were like, how ah, about Veterans Day? And then that, it was like, oh, come on, what do we do? But then it was like, oh, sure, we could do it. Uh, fills of that. And uh, uh, and then we'll say, well, it'll be great. It'll be like, you know, uh, father and son getaway weekend with Arnold and Gerald and, uh, and, and uh, Grandpa and Mr. Joe Hansen. So it was, um, it was, uh, 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 that's what's great too about making a, a series that has that big of a cast. In the time that we had, we really got to develop the storylines of tons of those characters. Like you knew a lot about Helga's family. You actually spent a lot of time with uh, Harold's family, Rhonda, Phoebe, uh, and Gerald. And, and so, you know, you even went home with characters like Sid and, you, you got to look into um, Eugene, <laughs> and and, uh, and so in the time that you had to, with a hundred half hours, which is you know not two hundred stories, but nearly, that's a lot of stories. That really gives you a chance to to get deeply into the lives of a lot of characters, and then once you and you, it keeps building, and he 
years go by and you have all this information now. You're like, well, I know this about Phoebe and, and her dad and her mom and, you know, where their house is. And then, and so you, you, you it becomes easier. You go, oh, that'd be cool if, if, uh, if uh, Grandpa and Mr. Johansson were driving in the front and Arnold and Daryl were sitting in the back and they go on a you know two-day trip to the Capitol, um, you could sort of imagine what would happen. <laughs> That's what I love. I love, I love that kind of uh, that just that reality that grows out of making a, a a series that has that many episodes. It just gets easier in a way. It gets harder. It's harder to write. Like it became harder to come up with a decent Arnold story, for example. We'd, we'd think really hard about like where Arnold was going and what we were going to do with him. And so it's in some ways like, all right, well, we kind of used up this and there's no more of that, and, you know. But on the other hand, there's there were a lot of times when you felt like situation, all you had to do was like, well, if we put these two characters together and then they were here, and you could sort of picture what would happen. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I, and... Oh, go ahead, Kev. Oh, no, go ahead, Patty. You go first. Yeah, um, another thing that I was really, really fascinated by was that the adults in the show were just as developed as the kids because let's just say if we go back to any show that involves with kids, you either never see the parents or you do see the parents and they're just there to give off advice or whatever. But they are be stupid. Yeah, they're pretty stupid. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, trust no, that was me. Fun. I, I, well, there was a, there was a huge, uh, kind of almost a, a, a strong will on the part of the writers to uh, do stuff with the adults and from the network. Um, and you know why not? Because it was you know we could talk about adult uh, things that adults are you know feel like like depression or or you know thwarted to ambition or or uh, you know just just being like fed up with something and all these things that that adults feel that aren't necessarily kid issues. And um, and so we wanted to do it. There was a strong desire on the writer's part to to get that. And, um, you know, there were years where the network kind of pushed back. And in general, in general, they'd be like, come on, you know, you're, you're pitching a show where the kids aren't even hardly there, you know? And I said, no, no, you know, here's how Arnold will be in it, you know? But, you know, Arnold is a, is a, is a kind of a mellow, kind of passive guy. And so... Yeah, um, it, it wouldn't be obvious to the network like why why we were spending all these time with characters. I remember uh, uh, I love Coach Wittenberg and uh, and his relationship with uh, Tish. Um, the fact that in about four Wittenberg shows, I think there's four, maybe there's more, but in, in about four Wittenberg shows, you meet Tish in the second one, and then they they're broken up, and then they get back together, and in every episode they're kind of always about ready to fall apart. And uh, Coach kind of has to win her back, and Arnold usually helps. He's kind of like a little, you know, he's like a little Cupid, kind of helping. And, and <laughs> then you can do a funny kind of Arnold Helga thing where she's kind of along and, you know, like being Helga. And you kind of like, you know, the one where they, remember where Coach uh, remarries Tish, and then Helga got to imagine remar- or marrying Arnold. I mean, that stuff is hilarious. But we had to really fight for those shows at that time because they'd say, oh, come on, it's all about it's all about an adult, you know. It's not even relatable to kids. And we would say, no, no, it'll be great, you know. <laughs> but, but uh, the, you know, that was the note. If there was a show that was really featured an adult, they would say, you guys are just going too far here. You're, you're making shows about adult concerns and kids aren't even going to care. But, uh, you know, it, it's all fine. When you look at it now, you look at 100 half hours over five seasons, it's just a huge mix of all these different things. And kids just watch each one as they come on. They don't care. You know, they're not like, oh, I'm not going to watch this one. It's about an adult. They don't, you know, they're basically there because they're fans of the show and they're just going to watch whatever we dish up. Yeah, definitely. And James Belushi did a fantastic job as Coach Whitney. Oh, I loved him in that. I, I thought those guys were hilarious. It was, um, yeah, uh, Jim Belushi and, and uh, God, I'm sorry I'm blanking on the name of the, the actress who plays Trish, or Tish, but um, they were old friends. It's Kathy uh, Moriarty, that's her name. Uh, and she, she's a great, you know, character actress who, who was in, you know, um, Raging Bull for crying out loud. And, and it turned out we cast them both separately because uh, Tish came in the second uh, Coach episode. And we didn't realize it, but, but uh, Belushi and uh, Moriarty were old friends. And they, they, she had like a, like a restaurant in, in Beverly Hills. And she had like a pizza place in Beverly Hills. And Jim Belushi would come over and hang out there. They were like, hey, they'd see each other. Hey, how you doing? So it was, it was wonderful to have them in the recording studio. They 
here we go again. Remember you were asking me earlier what were my favorite guest stars? There's two more. You know, Jim Belushi was hysterical, and we loved him. And when we, we met him and brought him in and, and uh, said, described uh, Coach Wittenberg to him, he said, oh, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, I had a, you know, like a kind of an asshole, kind of idiot coach who, who uh, speaks in malaprops. You know what I mean? Coaches always saying things that don't make sense. They were like, he said, I had one of those. It was Mr. So-and-so. And, and, and so you know what I mean? That he was just channeling his, like, eighth grade coach. And, and he was killing it. He was just like, it was, everything he did was hilarious. And then it's really authentic, you know what I mean? It's like, then it's just like a real guy. You know, like, we know this guy. So it made all of the coach episodes really funny. And then he and uh, Kathy Moriarty playing Tish, they would just get into this really funny, like, you know, fighting and then making up. And I love it. The, there's a couple of them that end with him finally, like, yes, sweet Tish. You know, like he's telling her, like, you know, I love you, baby. And then she's like, oh, Jack. And then... <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, I think that I find that very fascinating, Craig, that you have all these characters intertwined with one another, and you were able to have them all connected, and each character were able to fit together into one, and they didn't always have to be about just one particular character. It can be about multiple characters. Like, you know, even though that the show is called Hey Arnold, it wasn't always focused on Arnold. Right. Yeah, there were. It, it could be about any anybody. Generally, in a half hour, we would try to make it at least one of them be kind of Arnold's story, and have and and generally we might lead with it. You know what I mean? Like, and which is actually what we do with Dinosaur Train too. You know, your your A story in a half hour is kind of your your feature story. Your B story is a chance to be a little bit more like kind of about the other stuff that's going on, and and that's. And definitely in Hey Arnold, that was what was happening. So when when we paired them, sometimes we, not, we, wasn't, we weren't so lucky. You know, sometimes we would pair them just kind of in the order that they got made, and we didn't have that much choice. But I tried to make it so we led with an Arnold story, and then maybe the second one might be about the ensemble. And it, it, but there was this huge variety. You could never tell what was going to happen. You know, it, it just you'd make it go, oh, okay, that's <laughs> that's that's what's happening this time. But. Um, yeah, I love I love the kind of we call them the B stories, you know, that are just sort of about something else. Have you and, always uh, had a love for dinosaurs? Because I've noticed that even with Hey Arnold, there's Dino Land. Yeah, oh, I know, isn't it great? And I don't know if you've seen the original um, Arnold uh, claymation shorts. Yes, I have actually. In fact, before I saw Hey Arnold, I was five years old, and I remember watching them on Sesame Street. That's oh actually. My God, so you saw the one where he rides a chair and uses his imagination yes oh my gosh well, I, 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 as a five-year-old that's awesome yes that's i remember it was in the 90s uh, 91 yeah. just to be precise i was five and you know I, I i saw that for the first time and i loved it that was like one of my favorite sesame street stuff because i was into claymation i grew up with yeah. you know Wee's playhouse and gumby so, and oh, so you saw the penny cartoons y- also yes i did oh that's great wow well that's really cool because that's really the origin of arnold was first First, I was, um, I moved down here to L.A. to do the Penny cartoons, because I've been a clay animator for years in Portland, but um, the, when Pee Wee, uh, when the play, Pee Wee's Playhouse started, I just thought that was the coolest show ever, and I really wanted to be in on that, and I put together a sample reel of my claymation and sent it to the producers of Pee Wee's Playhouse, and then they called me, because the show moved from New York to L.A. for second season, and it had been done in Manhattan at a place called Broadcast Arts for just the first season, which is incredibly brilliant. I think that first season of Pee Wee's Playhouse. And I saw those cartoons, and I saw the Penny cartoons, and I was like, oh, man, look at this. It's claymation, but remember the dinosaur family lived in the mouse hole? And, yes. And I, and I was like, oh, my God, i got to be on this. So anyway, then they, they did. They hired me to come down 
to LA to do a uh, second and third season of Penny. And, um, and so we, my wife said, why don't we just move to LA for good? Because her brother lives here, Matt Graney. And, uh, and so we were like, sure, let's, let's, let's give it a shot. So we moved here and that was 25 years ago. Wow. And uh, so then I did the Penny cartoons. And, and, and those, those, um, the, the jobs would only last for a couple months and then you'd be back on hiatus. And so in the downtime, I was just here in LA now, and I was going, God, I gotta come up with something on my own. So I made those Arnold claymation shorts in the Penny style. In other words, clay, but shot on glass with a camera that's shooting down from above. And the backgrounds are behind the glass that are just cutouts and stuff. And so that was the, those original shorts. Arnold Rides a Chair was the, the third one I made. And I just, uh, TV, or Sesame Street uh, gave me a call I think it was about 1990, they gave me a call. They said, hey, we'd love you to make uh, some shorts for us. And I know that you've already created Arnold. So if you want to make Arnold shorts for Sesame Street, you can. And, and you can, you know, retain the rights to your character. We won't, we won't say that it's our character. And I thought that was a fantastic deal. And I was a huge fan of Sesame Street. I should say, too, you were asking me about my animation influences. You can put that up there, too, with Warner Brothers and uh, um, Charlie Brown. Also... Sesame Street, when it came out in 1969, that was a that was a watershed, huge change on the animation scene because Sesame Street was seen by millions of kids. It was a very popular show instantly as soon as it came on TV. And it was full of that super cool, late 60s, kind of like hippie, pop, kind of like, you know, Peter Max, that weird, strange um, psychedelia, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm not going to say Jordan Pepper, but I really mean like, you know, Yellow Submarine was, you know what I mean? That kind of psychedelia. Yeah, Those so early works, and they were a lot of more done by Jim Henson. I should give him props because I work for the Henson Company now. And Jim Henson, not only did he do the Muppets and perform every day and write write songs and sing, and dude, he did all that stuff as a as the Muppet guy. But he also was making a lot of those little animated shorts that were on. There were these sort of exploding numbers and kind of alphabet things that were really psychedelic. I don't know if you remember those. Uh, yeah, we do remember. In fact, we're actually both huge Muppet fans. Wow, well, that's cool. So anyway, you know, so early Sesame Street was, uh, was a big influence, too. And so when I, when I uh, was asked by Sesame Street if I'd make shorts for them, I was thrilled. It was By then, it was about 20 years later. And in fact, I think they had some kind of like, I remember they had some 20th anniversary uh, celebration in New York where they showed uh, uh, 20 years worth of animated shorts for Sesame Street and the Arnold short, Arnold Rides a Chair was included in that. And also I made a couple, you may <laughs> probably don't remember this, but there were two little shorts about a girl named Lillian that was also claymation. And, and I just made that as well. I made Arnold and I made Lillian. Nice. Arnold was the thing that took off. And the reason that Arnold took off was I made those claymation shorts, and then uh, Matt Groening, uh, The Simpsons took off around the same time, and then all of a sudden The Simpsons was just huger than huge. And uh, Matt asked me if I wanted to do comics for his monthly Simpsons magazine. That would have been 90, 91, probably. And I said, sure, I'd love to. And I did Arnold uh, comics. And so when I went to Mary Harrington, who was then the head exec of Nickelodeon, I'd say that was 93. I went with my Rugrats writer friends, Paul Gervain, uh, Joe and Sullivan, Harris, Steve Vixton, John Greenberg, Peter Gaffney, and me, and we went, we went in, all of us, to Mary's office to pitch new cartoon ideas for Nickelodeon. And she didn't like any of our ideas, and she kind of, she thought, six guys that was ridiculous like who's going to be in charge and it really was sort of a silly idea but we were sort of like we thought we'd be this sort of band of brothers you know <laughs> and, and no one was going to be in charge but that that never would have worked but anyway we went in and pitched it and she saw they said after we pitched all our stuff and we'd run out of ideas they said Craig show me your penny cartoons and so I got out a, a reel that I had a tape of my penny cartoons and on the front of it were those Arnold shorts uh, and Arnold Escapes from Church was what she saw. And she loved it. She said, who is this? This is fantastic. And I said, oh, it's this Arnold character I created. <laughs> she said, well, is it like, what else have you got? And I said, well, there's these comics. And I showed her the 2D drawings. And uh, the comic that I showed her in a Simpsons magazine was in that episode, he rides different roller coasters all day. 
and he's completely, he's like at the, he's at the, the you know, Magic Mountain kind of place, and he rides all these roller coasters, and every single one, you see him, and he's completely deadpan, showing no expression as it goes down another hill, and then he goes home, and he goes to bed, and it's night, and he sits up screaming, and that was the last panel where Arnold sits up in bed screaming, it's a, it's a very funny drawing, and she, she said, she pointed at drawing, she says, I love this, let's do this. <laughs> and I said, okay, so and then the meeting broke up and we all left and she stopped me in the hall and said, hey, I want you to come back and, and pitch me this Arnold guy. So I did. I came back like in another week and, and I brought along Joe and Saul there and he picked the you know, my writers and I said, we'll do it. We'll make, we'll make, we'll write you a pilot and so on. So that was fall of 93 and then she, uh, she ordered the pilot. I think we made it in spring of 94. And then it uh, it got picked up the next fall and or the next winter and was on we went into production in uh, January of '95. So it actually it all happened pretty quickly and pretty smoothly and, and in a really funny you know backwards way. Quite interesting there, Craig. Quite a backstory. Yeah, yeah, it was a good it was good it was a good opportunity. And isn't that funny too? Like you think about me making those little claymation shorts for Sesame Street. Uh, that's that's like who knew? You know, you just you know any, any chance I got to do any kind of work at all, I was. I, was, I would just do and you know the opportunity to go over and be a story editor on Rugrats and I directed a couple of Rugrats episodes too uh, in its first season I, of course I wanted to do it I was thrilled I thought what fun man uh, God War uh, Chupo and Arlene Klasky were cool and their their little shop in, in Hollywood was cool and they were making Simpsons as well at that time and uh, I was just like this is the place to be man this is fucking awesome <laughs> and Nickelodeon I, I liked everything Nickelodeon was doing everything they were doing was was uh, uh, new and different and uh, I loved the management at, at Nick uh, Jerry Layborn and her uh, scandal they were awesome people and, and Jerry God, she was just phenomenal she loved me when I got there and she said you know what I was Helga and I was like God I'm in you know <laughs> this is going to be great I'm, I'm working for a lady who thinks she's Helga? How, how much better could it be? You know. And so, uh, and in fact, I showed her those early. I remember her looking at a couple. She looked at the hat. You know, and the hat is the one where Helga. You first see Helga's Arnold shrine made out of bubble gum. And she just laughed and laughed and was like, "Oh yeah, that's me, man." And then, <laughs> and then I was like, "Wow, you know, it gets to be. This is what we get to do." And and. Everybody agreed. It was like it was unanimous. Like Helga was a breakout character. They loved her. All, you know, Nickelodeon was a, a network run by a lot of women executives. It was a very female place, and they all thought Helga was cool and funny and relatable. So instead, you know what I mean? Instead of being like, uh, yeah, you're gonna have to tone that down, man. That's pretty weird." They were like, "I love this. This is just right." You know? So that is why it got to be what it was. Was Helga? was, you know, thoroughly appreciated by the network. And and I thought it was kind of undeniable, you know, Franny was so funny. It was this great voice, you know, her really realistic, sounded like a child. But she was so furious, it's just so powerful. Like, a, she could kick ass, you know, you could just tell by that voice that she wasn't gonna take any crap. And when she, you know, and then right away, she like grabs Harold and they like pulls him up by the scruff of his neck. So the, the biggest bully in the class, Helga's gonna kick his ass. And you go, okay, this is a powerful character. <laughs> and I, I think that it was partly the way she's drawn, you know, kind of the, you have to give credit to the artist, you know, and me for coming up with her and, and Puck and some of my favorite board guys for fantastic drawing. Tuck Tucker is just a brilliant artist and he did great stuff with her. You know, I was like, this is so great. I got, I got Tuck running with this. He's making these hilarious drawings of Helga. All those early episodes were um, that sort of key kind of to me the kind of key Helga exposition Tuck Tucker really should get a lot of credit for that also a woman named Kelly James um, sure. was another uh, board director who did really definitive early Helga stuff Kelly and Tuck I'm, I kind of think of as my favorite uh, Helga drawers but you know I've had a lot of practice drawing Helga too so I can draw Helga pretty well too <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working with Jennifer Tilly who did the, oh, Jennifer Tilly, the she's great. I think I feel like she came only once, or maybe we had her twice, but I know she played Ernie's girlfriend. Yeah. She was, I, I feel like she played another character for us, too, and, and not, not that Lola or whatever her name was. But um, but Jennifer Tilly's great. She's funny. She has a wonderful sound. You 
know, she's perfect for voiceover because it's a really warm, kind of cool, sexy girl character that, that's, that I just thought she nailed it. She was really funny. Oh, yeah. Especially when she's in Monsters, Inc. and she plays Cecilia. You know, she's got that uh, voiceover, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then she was in Bride yeah. of Chucky. <laughs> she was in all those Chucky movies, so she played uh, Chucky's girlfriend. <laughs> that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's interesting how she went from voice acting to that, but that's cool. I, another quick question I wanted to ask you, Craig. I'm sorry, but if you had to pick a, a cartoon character, any cartoon character, just let do like a, a, a weird, cool, like crossover with Arnold. Who would you pick? Oh, a, a character to cross over with Arnold? Yeah, like any cartoon <laughs> uh, character. Good question. Let's see. It would have to be kind of from a, a fairly kind of realistic universe, right? You know, yeah. it, it, it has yeah, to be. Yeah, anything. It, it doesn't matter. Anything. Yeah. It'd kind of be kind of funny to see uh, see the Charlie Brown characters in their world. Oh, that's right Charlie in. Brown and Arnold. I can imagine that. That'd be cool. Yeah. It's funny when I, I, I have enjoyed seeing all the crossover stuff that fans have drawn. You know what I mean? Where they just mix it up. They seem to like to mix up uh, the Arnold characters with anime characters a lot. And, yeah. Uh, I, know. I don't know. I know yeah, yeah. Too, right, Patty? Me, me, yep. Characters from a Miyazaki movie like Totoro. That would be awesome. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> My neighbor Totoro with Arnold. That'd be kind of cool. It, it has be, like that realistic Arnold's, setting. Yeah, that'd be cool. It's, Arnold? Yeah, because you know, how Arnold's about this, Arnold comes about, from a, a kind of a, it's, you know, we have the universe that you're in. How about Archie? It's sort cool? of romantic and it's kind of, we try to make it lit realistically. You know, they have like real skies and stuff. And that's what I always loved about Miyazaki's work is it's so beautiful. You can really picture it. You can just picture being there. The, the there's shot, I used to, when I, I, I taught a storyboard class a long time ago, and, and one of the sequences that I like to show, I would show like a little bit of movies every time we, um, or cartoons every time we met, because it just gave me something to do and fill up the hour. And uh, I, I showed the sequence in Totoro where um, it starts with a frog and it ends with a frog. And it's the night scene where uh, the, the cat bus comes and, and picks up Totoro. Remember, and then first, first the real bus comes, and their dad's not on it, and they're like, eh, you know, and then another bus comes, and it's that cat, and then Totoro gets, oh, he, he like stands next to them, and then he gets on it, and then he rides away, and that, at the beginning of that scene, there's a frog sitting in, sitting in a puddle, at the end of the scene, there's a frog sitting in a puddle, and it's just that, the thing I loved about it was his stuff was so real, it's like, it's just like a rainy night, that you could really, it's just like you're there, and it's just, they're so good, they're, the paintings are so beautiful and believable. And he always had great artists that could do kind of weather effects, like clouds or like a specialty of his. And I'm just a real fan of that stuff. I love it. I always would tell the artists when when we would, I'd try to figure out how to shoot it. Like, let's make it look like it's kind of magic hour, you know, sunset or, or dusk or, you know, and then night. And those are my favorite. It's just, you know, when things look their most beautiful, is what we would try to do. And then, of course, with Hey Arnold, it was kind of ironic because it's this sort of funky city. But the idea was they live in a really kind of a kind of sketchy, run-down um, cityscape. It's not, it's sort of a poor part of town. And, and, uh, and yet it could be really beautiful. You know what I mean? There were a lot of scenes where it was just like, you know, Pigeon Man or something where it's, he's up on the roof and it's incredibly beautiful. Now, there are a couple of more questions right before we conclude the episode. Um, I remember uh, just a couple of weeks ago you were at uh, San Diego Comic-Con 2013 and you were talking about your new project, Sky Rat. Can oh, you, yeah. Can you I tell can't us? remember. Did, anything, did you see anything about it online or did you... Because uh, I, I don't know if they showed like my whole... My whole everything I said. They showed like little tiny clips of it, unfortunately. Uh, especially on like Nick.com. As for anything on, um, on Comic-Con... No. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I said, I no, they didn't really show too much of it because I think in that certain panel, I think there was a rule of not recording unless you're like this big editor for oh, the right. website. Oh, right, yeah, the official, right, the only, the, only like the official con uh, recording, yeah. right? So uh, can you tell us a little bit about it, right before, you know, that, that doesn't spoil anything? Yeah, you bet, because it's only, right, I'm only uh, developing it so far, we're not, we're planning on uh, making a pilot just to the usual development process at Nick where or any of these places where you know you write up a show bible and then um, write a, a pilot script and then make uh, you know actually produce a pilot and so 
so I'm at the sort of pilot outline and, and show Bible uh, phase. So it's pretty early. I don't want to say too much, but it um, one of the things that's funny is I was just talking about the kind of this urban, kind of ugly but beautiful, and the kind of romantic lighting. I really want Skyrat to kind of look like it's in the same universe as Hey Arnold, even though it's about a rat who dreams of flying and uh, um, you know his friends, um, these pigeons who fly him around once in a while, and uh, <laughs> the, um, the the city rats that live under the under the city square that are also his friends. I mean, that's basically it's the world of rats under a city and kind of in a pizzeria that they sort of take over and uh, up on a rooftop where the, the uh, brother and sister pigeon live and that those are the world and the rooftop is kind of not it's going to be it's it's not unlike Pigeon Man it's basically there's a kid who uh, uh, named Lucio who um, is sort of like a romantic like middle school age kid who's sort of like a, a little bit of a dreamy you know kid not unlike, um, not unlike Arnold, and, and not unlike like if he was like a kid pigeon man. And and uh, even though that's not like the main character is the is the rat, the one who wants dreams of flying. But um, that those are kind of the worlds, and so it's not unlike Hey Arnold's world. I haven't gotten very deeply into it yet. I'm I'm uh, just doing the first drawings, but I know um, what I loved about um, Hey Arnold was the way the backgrounds were painted. And the kind of color palette that we used, and the uh, the sort of hundred-year-old buildings, kind of the city blocks were very kind of residential, and you know they reminded me of neighborhoods in Seattle and Portland that I knew when I was a kid, and and also neighborhoods like Brooklyn and New York, and so um, it, it's you know it's similar territory in that way. Wow, that sounds really yeah. interesting. I know. I really, I'm really enjoying doing the work on it right now. I'm drawing. I'm drawing on it right now, and I'm, uh, I'm, you know, meeting with Nickelodeon on a regular basis as we just sort of move this development forward. So uh, I hope they like. I worked on the outline in the last couple of weeks, and uh, I can't wait to make it. It's like this. It's like when you, you know, my favorite kind of work is when you you're working on a, a story that you're going to tell, and if, if that story makes you happy, it makes you think, oh God, I can't wait to make this story, then you're, that's the best work there is. So that, I feel that way about Skyrat. It seems like if, if they're cool with this and they let me make this story I'm trying to tell, I, I will love it. So, and you know, I, you know, I'm you sure that you're interested in, in kind of what the future of Nickelodeon is, and I just hope to get back into Nickelodeon after, after being away for a decade. I, I hope to get back in with them, make stuff they want, make them happy, and then once we're all happy again, um, you know, try to get the Arnold saga to continue wow. and, and tell those stories that I, was, I still would like to tell. So I hope they're cool with that. And I, I know there's a huge amount of effort on the part of fans to tell them that they'd like to see the Arnold stuff. But it really ultimately is up to Nickelodeon. And so for my part, I'm just trying to make it good with them again. And, you know, all of us be friends and, and uh, have the same goals and see if I can't convince them that we should do more Arnold stuff too. I think it'll work out really well. Um, I, I'm hoping yeah, that you will definitely. Yeah, we wish you a ton yeah, of luck, Frank. Thank you. Really want to see. You know, it sounds like a really great project, and we wish you so much luck on it. Absolutely, Thanks. and we really want you to focus on Skyrat. I mean, eventually, yeah. we do know that it's going to be a fantastic show. Absolutely. We're hope. We're hoping that you focus on it and delve into it and hopefully make it a new Nickelodeon classic. And then, if you know, if the best comes to best, then definitely, you know, we would love to see new Arnold projects and maybe the Jungle movie and maybe some new episodes. I mean, who knows where it, where it leads up to? Yeah, who knows, man? I feel I feel pretty good. It seems it seems, uh, it seems like uh, uh, some some great new uh, opportunities coming up with me and Nick. So I'm very happy about that and. And uh, it's nice to be it's nice to be back. Uh, you know that that was a, those were great years I spent with them, and I, I would like to think that we could do more stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask? Uh, no, I'm good right now. Yeah, and I'm also good as well. I think we can conclude this episode. So, uh, Craig, do you have anything to plug or promote right before we conclude? <laughs> um. Uh. Yes, whenever Arnold's on uh, Nickelodeon, watch it, and then they'll get good ratings and so on. <laughs> Definitely. You know, you I'm, really glad, man. I'm really, I'm, I'm really glad that Arnold is well enough loved and well enough 
12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning more. just to watch it it. on the 90s or all that. <laughs> so, and I also, okay. I, I can't wait to get the, the, you know, the DVDs. I'm so happy that Shout Factory, I'm sorry, I know we we're going to conclude this, but I'm so happy that they put those out on DVD. Oh. Yeah, oh, it's the best. I, I, love the, I love the fact that Arnold is, the entire series is on DVD. I oh, really it's... think that's the best way to watch it. It's even better than Netflix because on the DVD, all those credit sequences are intact. All of those yeah. custom, we did tons of like custom credit sequences that kind of, the story kind of flows into the credits and music plays and little remixes and stuff. And all that's on the DVD series, so that's a great way to go. I would definitely tell fans, just go get all the DVDs, man. Buy them all. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. definitely. I'm on you on that one. Mm-hmm. Best better buy those DVDs, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, right on. Anyway, so yeah, that concludes this episode of Casual Chats. Uh, Craig, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks a lot. And it was nice talking to both of you. Talk to you it's soon. A pleasure. Thank you so okay. much. I just have to say, Craig, that um, t- when, when I wrote you that letter 10 years ago, wanting to see the Jungle movie release, I never knew that one day we would actually be talking together. <laughs> Life is long, what can I say? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's always some there's always some unexpected surprise around the corner, man. You just never know what's gonna happen. Absolutely. So until then, we will definitely see you in the next one. So bye bye. Alright. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye.